Hey there, this is Erica Kelly, and you're listening to Southern Fraud True Crime. This is where I would normally warn you about graphic content, but the only warning you need today is for some minor explicit language. Because today we have something a bit different. I had the great honor of interviewing the internationally best-selling author, Karen Slaughter. She has sold over 36 million books that have been translated into 35 different languages. She has written 24 novels, starting with Blindsided in 2001, and most recently The Good Daughter in 2017, which came out in paperback a couple of weeks ago. She's not only one of the most successful and prolific thriller writers in America, she is a woman standing out in a genre that was long dominated by men. She's also a Southern woman with a great reverence for Southern writers, which shines through in her work. Whether it's her Grant County or Will Trent series, or her brilliant standalone novels, her uniquely feminist Southern voice has entranced fans and critics alike. And she doesn't shy away from the gore. She has a distinctive gift for detail without titillation. Her intent is to tell you about a crime, the immediate shock, the investigation, and most importantly, the aftermath. What happens to those left behind? And Karen knows her stuff. She works closely with law enforcement, forging relationships with everyone from beat cops to coroners to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. And that level of expertise and eye for detail is what truly sets her apart in the thriller genre. So sit back, have some sweet tea, whiskey, or whatever tickles your pickle, and enjoy this lovely chat with the remarkable Karen Slaughter. I'm so glad this worked out. I am a huge fan. I was extremely excited to get that email. I feel like I've been reading you for almost two decades now. Is that right? Oh, shit. Yeah, I guess two decades. Yeah. Yeah, that's about right. I, I feel every freaking decade right now. <laughs> Same. I want to say 2000, 2001 was your first book. Yep, that that's is correct. Right. Yeah, I've literally been a fan ever since then. You and I also share a great love for Flannery O'Connor and Margaret Mitchell. I know you began The Good Daughter with a quote, and I think you've done that before. Am I right? Yeah, I quoted Flannery O'Connor. I do too. Absolutely. And as well, Margaret Mitchell. Are there any other authors that really speak to your work that you find influenced? Well, you know, those those are a couple of great Southern ladies. So, you know, I, I don't know. I think I always think about when I went to church with my grandmother and how she would take me around and introduce me to all her friends. And as soon as a friend turned around, she'd say something awful like, well, you know, she's a drinker. You know, her husband lost all their money. Or So everybody had these deep, dark secrets. I think that's a very typical Southern thing. I love Kendi Stockett because one of the funniest things she said was that when she was living in New York, people up there don't know how to gossip. And I think they do down here. And, you know, if you, you look at Gone with the Wind or something like anything Flannery O'Connor wrote. One of the things I loved about them is they wrote how people talked, or at least the people I heard. So that was kind of a revelation for me that you didn't have to, I don't advocate not knowing grammar by any stretch because it's fun to make fun of people who don't, but they certainly knew in dialogue that you can break some rules grammar wise and just talk. How Absolutely. People talk. That's, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's true for podcasting as well. It was something that I learned when I started writing podcasting is you don't write to read, you write to speak. And I kind of feel that way about your books. It feels like I'm, I'm listening to somebody. Well, that, hey, that's good. That's what I I'm trying to do. Awesome. It works. I'm not going to lie. I, I've, I've read up on you a little bit. I do my homework. And yeah. <laughs> don't uh -oh. worry, I'm not, I'm not that stalkery. No, I'm just saying. No, most of those lies. please tell me uh, the, the lies out flowers in the attic. It's not a lie, right? Oh, I, I love all those books. I truth. love Lucy Andrews. Obviously, she's a Southern writer, and, and a lot of people are ashamed to admit that. How do you feel about that? You know, I think it's fantastic. That's my generation, man. So I had V.C. Andrews, Flowers in the Attic. I had Lace, Which One of You Bitches is My Mother. I had uh, General Hospital, you know, that lovely love story about Luke and Laura where he, where he raped her. But it was okay because they ended up getting married and being in love. I mean, I just had all these positive messages for women yeah, that I'm so too. grateful for. I absolutely feel the same way about Luke and Laura. We are absolutely of the same generation for sure. And I love that she's actually getting her due respect now, though. I don't think that was true for so many years. But I think we're coming to a place where there's a greater appreciation. Do you think that as well? 
Are you talking about no, Lord no, no, from no, I'm Hospital? Andrews, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, V.C. Andrews. Yeah, you know, I mean, everything was such high drama. And as a 13-year-old girl just filled with hormones and lust and guilt and shame and all that stuff that 13-year-olds, I don't know if they still have it. I don't talk to 13-year-olds. I, I find them kind of boring. But, you know, for me, that those were ideal. But I will say that it wasn't until I was in college and somebody brought it up in a, a lit class, some asshole was like, oh, well, this is horrible. It's incest. And I, I was like clutching my pearls. It's like, are you kidding me? I never even thought about that, that it was incest. And I can say that because you're a Southerner. You know, I wouldn't say that to anybody up north because they'd just assume that we're all having incest down here. But I was shocked because I, I just Same thought it was a I don't, love story. I don't think I understood it when I was younger, and I do understand it now. And I'm a, I'm a stepmother to a teenage daughter, and I've actually tried to put that book in her hands. People might call me crazy, but uh, I think there's something to be said for exploring that part of yourself. It's not just the darkness, but also the sexuality and the curiosity. Well, it's the forbidden love, isn't it? I mean, that's what every teenager loves. The surest way to make a girl fall in love with a, a guy is, or anybody is to say, hey, don't do that. I mean, that's pretty much women all over. You tell them not to do something, they're going to be exactly doing right. it the next It's day. one of the things I love about your characters. I hate to get off topic, but I did recently read The Kept Women as well as The Good Daughter, and I have to say, I love Angie. You know, I think when I first started writing, I had this character named Lena, and people would say, I mean, some people loved her. And some people would say, you know, I'm sorry, I just don't like her. And I would say, good, you shouldn't like her. She's a horrible person. And it reminds me of something I heard a long time ago. Carol Shields, I think, said it or somebody like that, somebody really smart, said that when a woman writes a, an unlikable character, everybody assumes it's a mistake. And that a lot of people did with that character. But now people understand Angie's meant to be really bad. I and mean, she is awful. I don't understand the people who want her to be with Will because, I mean, if you like Will at all, you shouldn't wish this horrible person on him. You got Sarah who's supportive and loves him. I it does make for I mean, good she's, drama. She's deliciously funny. She's she's fun. And I also am a huge fan of, you know, a female villain. We don't, we don't get to see enough of that. We don't. And, you know, the truth is that women, when they decide to do oh, bad yes. things, are nasty. I remember... I was researching uh, a different book or a different topic when someone told me they worked in children's services over in Alabama, so the Roy Moore division. They said, you know, if you want to know some really horrific child abuse stories, none of us wants to go out when the call is for a woman abusing a child because they're just awful. They're sadistic. It's psychological. I mean, there's like this mental component to it that's so horrible. And of course, that's what I decided to write my second book about because I just thought, well, that's interesting. I d I've never really read anything about that. But if you look at, I mean, you your murder's kind of your hobby. If you look at uh, Marie Hilly, a lot of women who poison, I mean, they'll poison their own family. Then they'll rush to the hospital with them and take care of them. And then they'll give them some more poison. And I, they're just nasty. Uh you know, at least a man just will shoot you in the face or something, but women are There does awful. seem to be a bit more of a sadistic tendency. <laughs> when I research female murderers, those are actually my favorite cases. I, that You know, I think you can relate to, to having that kind of curiosity as well. But uh, yeah, I love it. Well, hey, that's great. I've read all read my second book. Like, when I say fangirl, I am indeed a fangirl. Now, it has been many years. I haven't gone back and reread. I did reread the Will Trent series this summer, though, this past summer. Oh, that's sweet. I love when it, when people do that. A lot of times I'll see on Facebook people are doing that in anticipation of a new one coming out. I should add, there's another Will Trent I'm working on now that's going to be out next year. It's fun to get back to him. You know, it's, real, it's really important to me because I know people love him and I love him and Sarah too. And I just want to make sure I'm giving the best story. So it took a couple of years for me to, to settle on this story for this book, but I'm really glad. It's It's been such a blast oh, I, getting back I into agree more. it. I, I love him. I love that series. I love Sarah. And I'm, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I did tell my listeners about this interview, and they were extremely excited. A few of them wanted me to fuss at you about Jeffrey, though. I knew that was fun. You know, I was in Germany last year in Dusseldorf for an event, and these women gave me this beautiful box of chocolates. It's called Cat Tongues. 
because they know I like cats, but the chocolate is, you know, Germans are weird. So they call it cat tongues. They're just solid chocolates that look like cat tongues. They're not real cat tongues. Let me make that clear. I got the box back and I noticed they had written on it. We will never forgive you for Jeffrey. I was like, I wasn't actually going to say those words, but that is what one of my listeners said. Please tell her I'll never forgive her for Jeffrey. (laughs) Yeah, I get that a lot. I get that a lot. And, you know, I I used to think it was a compliment because it meant that I wrote a really good character. But now I'm kind of invested in people liking Will and Sarah and understanding that it happened for a reason. I mean, I, I didn't just do it just to be a jerk or because I was bored with the character. I did it because I wanted to have meaning. And honestly, they were too happy. And people (laughs) think they want to read about happy people, but really they don't. It's a little boring. It's one of the reasons why Will is so complicated. But, you know, I wrote about Will right before the last book in the Grant County series. So I had planned from book number four of Grant County that he was going to be in Sarah's life. And and the book that he was in, Triptych, and then Fractured after that, those are the two books he has where he's alone. Those those two books are really about Will becoming the kind of man that Sarah Linton would be interested in. Because she doesn't put up with a lot of her. crap. She takes a shit. I love her. And I love that you see that far ahead. It's plotted out that far. And I'm not mad about Jeffrey. There's nothing like, I feel like, that character development and growth. And you, you need that gut punch. Sarah needed it. If you're going to move the series along. And, of course, I do adore Will. Well, you know, the thing is, I could have just kept writing Grant County books until I was 90, but I don't think people would have been happy with them. I wouldn't have been able to write books like The Good Daughter or Pieces of Her, which is my new book that's out this year. I mean, I really feel like it opened me up as a writer to go into some emotional depths. You know, if anything, I think it manifests itself in The Good Daughter because it's very emotionally driven. I mean, it is plot driven too. It's a thriller. People die and there's sex and all that good stuff. But it's also about how people cope with violence. And, you know, that last scene that Jeffrey and Sarah had, that I, that really informs me in a lot of ways as a writer. And I worked on a lot of things in The Good Daughter and in Pieces of Her, the new one, that you're going to see realized in Will Trent. I mean, it just makes Sarah and Will more multi-layered to be able to do stuff like that. So people have been patient. I absolutely agree. I, appreciate I read a, it. another quote of yours somewhere, and it was something like, I don't remember the exact words, and I failed to write it down, but it was something like something, and it may have even been in the book. I really did freshly just read uh, The Good Daughter, but it's something like everybody has something terrible that happens to them. That's very true, and it happens in your books, whether we like it or not, but, I mean, it's what propels the characters forward. Exactly. You know, I mean, and I, it goes back to my grandmother, because everybody has a deep, dark secret, Right. And exploring those secrets and figuring them out and what motivates the character, why they make the choices they do. I mean, that's very important to me. I want characters to make choices where the reader goes, well, that makes sense. You know, even if they don't agree with what they do, I want them to actually feel like it's an organic thing for the character to do. And you're not flipping back pages or wondering why this hero has come out of the, from whole cloth, you know, I just, I want people to, characters to be Following up with that, and I have to say, with The Good Daughter, we have to talk about sisters. That's amazing. Yeah, you know, I'm the youngest of three girls. It was hard for my sisters, because my parents always loved me best, because I was the smartest and the, the most beautiful, certainly the most successful. So, you know, even though I was the youngest, they had You're a lot to the most modest as well, I love it. I am. Well, it comes with being so beautiful. No, I'm I'm an older sister. I I understand that that younger sister thing, but I I love that in in those books. And I connected deeply with with that um, and Pretty Girls. And your standalone books are just incredible. I mean, you know, I have a, a deep love for your series, but I really feel like you're going somewhere with your standalone books. Well, thank you. You know, I really... I liked uh, in Grant County when Sarah and and Tessa, I liked their relationship, but Sarah's an older sister, so I don't key into as much of that. And when she's around Sarah, I I mean, Tessa, I just kind of make her bossy because that's what older sisters are. You know, for me, I I just, I really enjoy writing about that because your sister, 
I mean, she's a person who knows you better than anybody else, but also doesn't know you. Cause I think we're just set on who our sisters are when we're growing up and we don't really see them as adults or we kind of fall back on where we fall in the family tree. You know, my middle sister's around me. She waits on me hand and foot. She made me a sandwich the other day and she cut off the crust and she brought it to me and it was in my house and she just does that. But I did, I did remember one time when we were little, I scared the shit out of her. I hid under, our parents were um, at a party or something away from home. I hid under her bed. And when she got in bed, I grabbed her ankle and she scared the crap. She started screeching like a banshee. And the noise scared me so much that I got scared and ran into the closet and started crying and I wouldn't come out. And so when my parents got home, I was in her closet crying, just racked with sobs, and she got oh, punished for I scaring me. I think my sister me. has done something similar to me. You are definitely a little sister, I can tell. Yeah, I'm a scam. <laughs> As most little sisters are, mine would agree. Do you have more plans for, for some standalones? I know you've got another. I do. You know, it's just kind of where the story takes me. I've got a couple ideas for standalones. I really, with The Good Daughter and Pretty Girls, I really enjoyed talking about sisters. So for my other book, uh, Pieces of Her, my newest book, I thought I'd explore a mother-daughter relationship. You know, that's a really fraught relationship. It's like, I remember my best friend when I was growing up, I loved her mother and she hated her mother. And I think that's kind of typical. Really, the, the genesis for the pieces of her came from this line I thought of. I was in the shower. I got a notepad in the shower that's waterproof or write lines down. And it was something like, it's a truth universally acknowledged that when your mother says, your hair looks good today, what you hear is your hair has looked like shit for every single day of your life until now. Yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up. But, you know, because this is a thriller, I had to have the mom into some crazy stuff. So it was kind of fun because the one of the narrators of the story is Andrea. She goes by the name Andy. And she's uh, 31 years old and her life is kind of spinning out of control. And I really, I wanted to write about a mother and a daughter and just how different it is for women now as opposed to a woman in her 50s, right? Because, you know, so Laura is the mother. And then when she was in her 30s, women were expected to have children and, you know, not much of a career and being in service of the family. And I mean, a lot of that hasn't changed, right? But it, women are expected to work their asses off now and take care of their kids. But, you know, so for Laura, the choices as far as what her career could be were fairly limited. And and I remember when I was a kid, it was nurse, hygienist, mother, teacher, or if you wore glasses, you could be a librarian. And I think for women in their 30s now, it's they some of them have so many choices about what they can do that they're kind of paralyzed by it. And I wanted to explore that a little bit. And, and I felt the best way to do it was through a mother-daughter relationship. That makes relationship. a lot of sense to me. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's really funny. We have friends. I have friends that are like that as well. That, you know, your, your own mother can drive you crazy, but their mother you just adore. <laughs> and you, you can somehow relate to them easier. But And I also agree with what you're saying. I don't have children of my own. I have stepchildren. But it is, it's, we're in a generation where, yeah, you have to work your ass off and have it all. But so are they. And it's almost amplified. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I was, I was watching that thing that happened with Cardi B, right? <laughs> and then she's like, I'm going to have it all. And a week later, she's like, yeah, I got to cancel my tour because this is hard, yo. <laughs> so I think that's like a typical journey for a lot of women. I mean, when you're in, in your early 20s, you think, why do we need feminism? Everything's equal. And then you're 30 and you're like, holy crap, we mm -hmm. need feminism. And then in your 40s, you're like, everybody needs feminism. Get your shit together. You talk about being a thriller writer, and I have to admit, I've also always pretty much considered you a romantic writer. I love that there's both. Yeah, there is a bit of that in there, especially in The Good Daughter. You know, I love reading. Most writers do, at least the good ones, I think. And uh, I had been reading a lot of Leanne Moriarty. Oh, I love her. Well, you know, the thing is, in, in her books, a lot of the husbands are kind of useless, but there's always a, a husband who's like a really good guy and the wife just adores and loves him. 
And I wanted to write about a woman who loves her husband. You know, it's really easy to write about ones who hate him or want to kill him or, you know, suspect him of being a murderer or some stuff like that. But I wanted to write Charlie being really in love with her husband and having messed up in a not typical way. Well, maybe it's a typical way that she messed up. I'm not going to give it away what she did. It, I'd just say it was a non-sexual way. I think she did the thing that in relationships is like the first harbinger of the end. So I, I wanted to write about someone who just loved her husband and knew she'd screwed it up and wanted to find a way back, but didn't know how to do it. And of course, this is a thriller, so it ends up being murder. You, you tend to take my next question or my next comment, too, because that is something else I very much connected with was her love for her husband and, and him being such a good husband. And I have one of those and really appreciated that and connected with her as well. I love it. Well, you know, because I'm a woman and I write about men who do bad things, I also write about women who do bad things. But everybody's like, oh, men are so horrible in your book. And I'm like, really? Will's a good guy. Sarah's dad is a great guy. You know, Charlie Reed is a good guy. All these people, Ben is a good guy. And no one says to Lee Child, oh, why do you write about awful women? You know, or why are men the only good guys in your book? It's like, I don't know. It's weird. People, it, worry about things they shouldn't be it's sort of like the me too movement and people are like what about men it's like so oh, that's exhausting you guys. i hate when they do that yeah no yeah yeah so i've i've stopped trying to explain that i'm just like you know what go you on know what? just own, like man. we can have good men we can have good female villains and i love that balance in your work well i do try you know it was interesting to me because a lot of my books i have men who are killed and nobody seems to think they're as violent as when women are killed. And also, like, uh, Cop Town. No girls are killed in that. No no women are killed in that. But one of my publishers in Europe put a woman on the cover. I'm like, why is this terrified woman on the cover when that has nothing to do with the story? And they're like, because uh, okay. it'll sell. Uh, yeah. And Cop Town was incredible, the detail on that. Tell me about talking to lady cops. Wow, it was fascinating, man. The shit those gals put up with, it's amazing they didn't kill everybody. I mean, it really is. And some of the stuff I couldn't put in the book because I just thought this will be totally unbelievable. These women, Vicky and Dona, I, I thank them in the back of the acknowledgments. Um, one was a retired GBI agent. That's Georgia Bureau of Investigation. The other was an Atlanta police officer. And, you know, the funny thing is when we were talking and they were telling me these stories, they were hilarious, you know? We were laughing so hard, I was going to wet myself at one point because it was just crazy. And then I started writing about it, and I was like, wow, this is really horrible. And, what, and one of them even said to me, man, it was hard to read that because it just brought up all the old stuff that we had to put up with. They did every day have to put up with crap. Every single day they had to start over. They had to prove themselves again. Then they had stuff that people don't even think about, like the fact they couldn't get a credit card in their name because the bank didn't think that they would be able to pay it back even though they had a job. They couldn't get car loans. They couldn't rent apartments as single women in the city of Atlanta because it was assumed they would be prostitutes. There were a lot of barriers for them. And even after they had worked on the police force for a while, it was really incredibly difficult for them. And one of the questions I asked was, why did you do this job? Because every single one of them, you know, I mean, every day, not just being a cop, that's a hard job for anybody. But the shit they had to put up with on top of that was just unbelievable. And they all loved it. They loved the job so much that the other stuff didn't matter. And most of them, if not all of them, had applied for the job because somebody told them not to. Their mothers were like, you know, a man's never going to marry you. A normal man won't want you, which is true. They, most of them end up marrying other cops. Or you're going to become a lesbian or how can you wear pants every day? It's not feminine. I mean, these were real worries for mothers because, you know, it's, it, it's was especially hard back then to be a woman without a husband just financially. So it was the only job where women were guaranteed to be paid the same amount of, as men for the same type of job. 
And they also were able to have some sort of progress as far as being promoted and stuff like that, because it was kind of written in stone that you, you do these things, you can get promotions, you work this many years, you can get a bump in your raise. Uh, a lot of them went to school because they were their tuition was paid if they did well in college. And uh, But I, I do remember this one woman was telling me that she didn't mean to sign up to be a police officer. She went downtown because at the time, if you wanted to work for the government, you went to this one building and you filled out an application there. And she wanted to be a personal assistant or secretary for this guy who was a commissioner and he was hiring. So she went downtown. They told her what room to go to to fill out the application. And she got there. There was this big cop. And he said, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm here to fill out an application. And he said, you can't be a police officer. And she just kind of looked at him like, okay. He said, get on out of here, girl. (laughs) And she got so mad at him that she said, I have every right to fill out this application. And she sat down and it was for the Atlanta police. And so she filled out the application and she thought, you know, oh crap, now I got to come back tomorrow and find a place to park to fill out the right application. And she fills it out and she gets home and the phone rings when she's walking in the door and it's the police and they want her to come back for an interview. And she was worried that if she didn't come back, she would get arrested for wasting police time. So she oh went back gosh. the next day and they said, OK, well, you're approved and you need to show up to the police academy Monday morning. And she hadn't even told her husband. So (laughs) she goes home. She's like cooking dinner for her husband, cooking his favorite meal. He walks in, she gives him his drink. And she's like, you know, hey, this funny thing happened. And she told him. And he said, I'm putting my foot down. There is no way you are going to do this. And so Monday morning, she was at the police academy. And she, uh, when she retired, she was a captain with the police force. But that's why she did it, because all those guys told her she couldn't do it. There's no better reason. I love that. Absolutely. I mean, she was damn good at the job, too. I, clearly, she And that's the other thing that, that kills me about that. Not only did they have to overcome so much in their personal lives, but they had to be better. They had to be really good at that job. It's true. And, you know, they weren't given a lot of opportunities. A lot of times they'd roll up on a guy, you know, who was doing something bad. They'd been called out by dispatch. And then five minutes later, a team of guys shows up to back them up when they haven't asked for backup because they don't, you know, it's assumed they can't do the job. They can't protect themselves. And don't get me wrong. Women are built differently from men. There's not a lot of, of women who can physically match even a guy who's in the worst shape of his life. But women do know how to do this job. They know how to use a baton and they know how to de-escalate. You know, that's one of the problems we're seeing now. I think if you look at the 1970s, all these guys came out of Vietnam and they didn't know how to be in regular life where they couldn't carry a gun all the time. So they chose to be police officers, but they were militarized in a way that made them kind of inappropriate for the job because they always met violence with violence. They always met power with more power. And the fact is women can't really generally do that. And they have to talk people down and they have to de-escalate. And in the seventies and eighties, because so many women were involved with the police force, they actually changed the training because they saw the women had a point, you know, why arrest someone and beat them over the head with your baton and take them to the hospital and get sued when you can talk to them, calm them down, get them in the back of the car and take them to jail. That's incredible. I didn't know that about the changing of the training. That's that's really interesting. That's yeah, really interesting. yeah. We need more of that. You know, everybody loves small government until they see the police need more training. And, you know, a lot of what we're seeing as far as what's happening, you know, all these tragedies and it's poor training and poor screening of police officers because the majority of them are good guys They want the training. They want to be drilled on how to handle things appropriately. I can't think of many cops who want to be involved in some of the awful things that have been happening lately. And if you look at a place like Salt Lake City, you know, they were paying out tens of millions of dollars a year to citizens who have claimed that they had been harassed or beaten or even shot by the police. And they decided to funnel that kind of money into training their officers And since that training has been implemented, 
they haven't had one officer involved shooting. I mean, that just tells you right there. That's absolutely incredible. And I, you know, I feel what you're saying because I've caught flack for, for being hard on the police and sometimes I can't help it. It's where the story takes me, but I don't truly feel that way. I completely agree with you a hundred percent that that's not why they go into law enforcement. They do want help. Yeah. You know, it's such an important job and we don't support them. I mean, it's sort of like the military teachers. We just don't support the people we really need to keep our democracy moving, right? If we don't have great teachers educating our kids, we don't have smart citizens. If we don't support our military and our veterans, and I don't want to pay taxes. I'm not crazy about paying taxes, but I, I, I want my taxes to go to help these people and, and to give them the tools they need. I don't want a small government. I want a government that works for me. I agree. I completely agree. Oh, that reminds me of something else I read that you said I absolutely loved. And it's that, you know, stay at home mothers, there's no safety net for them in society. They don't get social security. Well, right. You know, it's kind of at the pleasure of their husbands and whatever the husbands put away for them. You know, a woman who's married, I think 10 years, she gets a piece of her husband's social security, but I mean, that's just a piece. We don't put much in place for, for women. We never have. There's a lot of women whose husbands have divorced them or for reasons unknown have divorced their husbands and they find themselves when they turn 65 that they don't have a lot as in way of the government supporting them. I mean, it's a real deficit. And if you think about, I mean, not just for white women, it's bad, but for women of color, it's they're left in poverty. And that's just not the way we should treat people. It's not. I couldn't agree more. And we all, you you keep circling back on things and I don't want to give too much away about the good daughter as well, but you're talking about current events and tragedies. And are you able to speak about that a little bit? Kind of the plot of the book. Oh, with the good daughter. Yeah. You know, there is a bit of a current event in that. That was unintentional. I guess I can say there's a school shooting. Yes. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. I was wondering. You know, the thing is they're so common now. So is it a current event or is it just doing what crime fiction does, which is holding a mirror up to society. In a lot of ways, it's really not about the school shooting. It's just about, so Charlie and Sam are these two young girls when the book opens. Don't worry, they're only young for a chapter. They're teenagers. And something really awful happens. And they both walk away with very deep scars, some of them physical, some of them psychological. In the first chapter, that's in the the prologue, in the first chapter, we catch up with them as adult women in this tragedy happens a school shooting but it's really more of a device to open up these old wounds for these characters and talk about what's happened to them because of this tragedy you know that's really the primary focus of my work is not the violence it's not scenes of of a graphic nature though I do think it's important to write about crime for what it is I don't want to ever feel like I'm smoothing it out or making it more digestible because crime is awful And I think we should show it for what it is. But really the whole point is to talk about how horrible things reverberate for years in people's lives. You know, even somebody who sees a car accident, they're going to think about that car accident the rest of their lives. It's just something that sticks with you. And to be a victim of crime or to witness firsthand a horrific crime, that changes a person. It makes them a different, altogether a different person. So that's really what I wanted to write about with a good daughter was just how that a crime in your childhood can resonate for the rest of your life. That's exactly, and that's exactly what I took away from it. And one of the things I was going to talk about is, you know, I, I write for a true crime podcast. I read police reports, court transcripts. I look at crime scene photos, and I'm not going to lie, and I won't say who it is, but in the murder, the first murder in the book, what you know, what sets the tone. Man, that was visceral. Um, I don't think I've ever understood exactly what it was like to stand next to somebody who was shot. And then I read your words and it was, ooh, the grit, the blood, the teeth. The You know, it, I think when you decide to be a writer of crime fiction, you have to decide what kind of writer you're going to be. You know, I love Janet Ivanovich because I think it's just good fun and I know what I'm getting every time. I'm not reading Proust. You know, and is it the book where she's with Joe or she's with Ranger? I mean, it just, it's, it's good fun, right? And I love that, but that's not the kind of writer I am. I want these crimes to resonate, you know, especially if you look at this Cosby verdict, 60 women and people were shocked that he got convicted because that just doesn't happen a lot where these people who do horrific things who have money and celebrity have to pay for their crimes. But, you know, not just that. I mean, good Lord, poor men 
a lot of times if they commit horrific rapes, okay, well, let's say the cop investigates it because rape is the only crime where cops say, hey, do you want me to investigate this or not? And let's, so it's investigated. Let's say they actually believe the victim because 90% of the time you're going to find a cop, on, especially in sex crimes, who's not, his default is not to believe the victim. You know, there's going to be a Netflix documentary about this poor woman. I think she was in Washington state. The police arrested her for making a false report of rape. And it was revealed something like five years later, she hadn't lied. Right. But her life, it was, there's a great true crime book about it. I can't remember. I read it in a ProPublica story a few years ago, but it was pretty amazing what this woman went through because the police didn't believe her. You know, that's, that's the thing. Women are not believed a lot of times. And it can be about crime. It can be about taking a pen at work, being late. It can be about health care. You know, women, I, I, I read a statistic about women patients and how something like two years is delayed in their diagnosis of a pain because when they go to the doctor, the doctor just thinks they're whiny women. I mean, even female doctors. So their pain is dismissed in a way that men's pain, self-reporting of pain is not dismissed. So you know, a lot of women have a delay in diagnosis because of that. So the fact is a lot of women are not believed when they talk about rape. We're more inclined as a nation to now, for some reason, to try to have parity. So if you talk about, I don't know, the quarter of a million women who report being raped to the police every year, we got to talk about the 3% where they were false there's this equivalency that doesn't really belong there. So when I talk about, when I write about sexual assault in my books, I want to show you what it is. I mean, I'm not going to do a gynecological experiment here, but I want to show you how horrific it is and how life altering it is because I, and I write this in the good daughter, a rape is a murder. And I'm talking about women, but men as well, men who are raped It takes the person you were going to be and kills that person. You are never going to have that ease in your life ever again. And you could argue any crime is going to do that because it's always going to be there with you. But specifically rape, you know, it's just going to, you're not going to be that person you were ever again. You can get back close to it, but you can't be 100%. So I want to show it for what it is. It's not fun. It's not sexy. It's not titillating. It's not a plot device. I want to write about it as, as I see it impacting the women around me. I respect that a great deal. And in, in, in podcasting, there's some that refuse to, to go into the details. And I was hesitant when I started out. And then I was like, then why am I doing this? It doesn't feel right. truthful. It's not as impactful unless I actually give the details. And, and it's hard. It, you know, it's, it's hard to do it sometimes, but I, I feel like it's important. Well, it gives people an understanding, you know, especially when you're talking about true crime. It gives them an understanding of what a violation it is. Yes, very much. I know we need to start wrapping it up, so I'm going to ask you a couple more things. I will say about the good daughter as well. I know how much your daddy means to you as a daddy's girl myself. Uh, this book felt like a love letter to your dad. Am I right about that? Yeah, it pretty much is. I mean, my dad's not a lawyer. He's a, he was a used car salesman. Now he owns a coin laundry. He's supposed to be retired. You know, I wouldn't want to date him, but because uh, he certainly has, a, he's got a great girlfriend now, but it took a while to find her. And he's got a, an ornery side to him that most of us slaughters have, but he is a great father. He's always been a fantastic dad. I know if I'm anywhere in the world, I can call him and he'll do whatever I need him to do. That's lovely. And I, I mean, I did, I adored Rusty. Every little thing he did, every scampish thing he did. I, yeah. My, my dad did, had passed, but I, I saw my own dad in him and I, I love that. I love that it was a letter. That's it's beautiful. Are you allowed to talk about any TV deals? Yeah. Well, so uh, the good daughter was optioned by working title. They did Bridget Jones and Victoria and Abdul and movies like that. I'm really kind of excited because this this fella who's in charge, I, I've uh, spoken with him before and he's just, he's really smart. He really gets the characters. He gets the tone of the story. He loves Southern stories. So, you know, he's checking a lot of my boxes right there, but he's also, you know, just, he's so experienced. So I'm happy with that. And my new book, Pieces of Her, has been optioned. I don't know if I can give the details about that. I'm pretty excited about that. So, And, of course, Coptown's been optioned for a while. We'll see. 
Yeah, I heard that too. What about your series? I had heard your series were as well. Uh, well, yeah, we you know, it. I I was working with some wonderful people, but they just couldn't get the script right, and so we all agreed let's just go our separate ways. You know, Will is so important to me, and Sarah, and it just has to be right, you know, because I would much rather have no option and nothing going on than have a bad show, right, or a bad Will Trent. So. I admire your integrity with that. Yeah, don't don't do anything to my Will Trent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't want people. They're already mad at me about Jeffrey. I don't know. Will wrong person's cast as Will. I'm probably gonna find like a decapitated horse on my. <laughs> well, Karen, this has been a dream and so much fun. Can you tell me anything else that's up next? I know you've got a new book coming out, and Good Daughter came out paperback this week, correct? Last week, yep. It came out last week. And Pieces of Her, my new book, comes out, I think, August 21st in the U.S. And we're probably going to do like a day before publication special thing in a store near Atlanta. So hopefully people will come out for that. That's fantastic. Well, again, th- this was such a pleasure. I'm, I'm a huge fangirl and... I I can't tell you how much I thank you for this. I'm going to have to edit out a lot of this fangirling, obviously. (laughs) Is there anything you'd like to leave the fans with? Well, thanks for sticking with me. Please know I still remember what it was like when I was a student and I had to save up for a hardcover book. And if it was crap, I was furious. And so just know that when you get my book, I've given my all to it. And I hope I'm giving you a great story and a good read and that you guys enjoy it. And if you don't, Please have the decency to lie. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, Karen, I've never wasted my money on you. I love it. And I love your attitude towards that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Southern Fried True Crime is produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Special thanks to Karen Slaughter for taking time out of her grueling tour schedule to chat with me. As a longtime fan, this interview is not only a dream come true, but so much fun. I've always admired her talent, and now I know she's just a regular old Southern Pistol. It felt like talking to an old friend on the back porch. Don't forget to check out her new book, Pieces of Her, coming out on August 21st. And the paperback edition of The Good Daughter is out everywhere now. I hope you've enjoyed this interview. I have a few more scheduled this summer and hope to make this a regular feature on Southern Fried, as books are a great passion of mine. As always, if you enjoyed the show, tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on Stitcher and many other apps. If you're interested in supporting the show, come check out my Patreon page or my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com, where you can make a one-time donation by hitting the donate button. I also have a merchandise store open at whatamaneuver.net. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can email me at southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I love hearing from you guys, so please feel free to reach out. I'm also all over social media. Just search the show name in your favorite platform if you'd like to connect with me there. If you're interested in discussing Karen's interview or any other episodes further, come check out my discussion group. It's linked to my main Facebook page. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.